Hi everyone and welcome to the youth service. I just want to ask you guys to join me in a moment of prayer and worship. Uh, I know it's hard despite the circumstances we can still join together in the name of the Lord. Um, I hope you guys are all doing well and I hope to see you soon. God bless.
guys thank you for taking time out of your day to come listen to god's word and to really spend time with him as a family whether it be with your family whether uh, it's just you kids here um so thank you guys um miss you all very much um despite the current climates i hope that everyone's willing and everyone's able to you know stay positive and stay productive so i hope you've had a productive week um and if not take your time this sunday to really assess the things that you've done assess what's going right what's going wrong and asking god to really um, help you uh, to increase productivity and to to do what he asks you to do uh, so guys uh, before we get into anything i just uh, like to pray for everyone dear lord i thank you for giving us a time whether it not be a place but a time where we can just really come to you lord rely on you hear your word hear your guidance I ask that you help us to seek your face and seek your voice, Lord, to listen to you speaking to us and to listen to any messages that you may have for us. Lord, please help us to stay dedicated and stay committed to getting to know you more and to developing our relationship with you during these times. With all this time on our hands, Lord, I ask that you help us to really reach for your word and reach for your messages and to really spend time with you and to develop that relationship with you. Lord, thank you for bringing us here to this day and for keeping us safe throughout everything that's going on. I ask that you continue to protect us and that you continue to guide us, Lord, and that you also help those uh, who are fighting um, the virus, those who are suffering with it, those in less developed places where they may not be as safe. I ask that you reveal yourself to them and that they rely on you for safest. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done for us. 
please bless the word that we are about to get into and I ask that you really display and you give out the message that you want those to know. Um, so thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay guys, so today I'm going to be speaking about a man, a prophet named uh, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. I don't know the pronunciation. I'm going to go for Habakkuk. Um, so forgive me if I butchered the name. Um, and he is a one of the minor prophets, so he's a prophet in the Bible, and he lived in the southern kingdom of Israel, um, Judea. So a bit of context, in this time, Israel was divided. It also abandoned God's word, so it was a time of, you know, worshipping idols. It was a time where people just abandoned the word of God and decided to do what they like. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much of it. Um, I think the best way to really learn about any, any story is to just get reading. Um, so, yeah, it's only three chapters, and we'll break it down as we go along. So if you'd like to turn to uh, Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, um, we'll read this together and we'll see uh, what God's trying to say to us. Um, so, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong, destruction and violence are before me? There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralysed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. So that's not the whole of chapter one, but I thought I'd just stop it right there um, to help really structure what we're doing. So within chapter one so far, what we've seen is that uh, this prophet Habakkuk, who is living amongst the divided Israel, amongst people who have abandoned God's word, who have abandoned the Torah, who are, who are living however they want to, who are living sinful lives. Um, here we see that he has a complaint uh, for God. Um, he sees what's going on around him uh, he, and he knows that there are some righteous people. It says um, the wicked hem in the righteous. So. Uh, hem stitching in your clothing so uh, wicked people are embedded so, embedded so they are integrated with uh, righteous people um, and so he understands that uh, the region is going through um, turmoil going through um, a bad time in the eyes of God um, and so he questions him he, he, he questions his, his, his God and he says violence uh, injustice there's wrong there's strife, conflict abounds, um, the law is paralysed, and he's crying out to the Lord. He's crying out to the Lord, and he's asking him for help. So he, he really, he's, he's, he's confused, he's, he's feeling a lot of emotions, and he's turned to God, and he's, he's calling for him, he's asking him, do you not hear me, uh, can you listen, uh, do you not see what's going on? So he's really trying to grab um, the Lord's attention. So yeah, that's what we can take so far from this is that Habakkuk has noticed the wrong around him and he's he's drawing God's attention to it. He's, he's asking him, do not listen. Um, so yeah, let's just carry on reading chapter one. Um, so it's from verse five now and we see that the Lord um, has answered Habakkuk. So he says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe. Even if you were told, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honour. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture, swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all four to five cities. They build either earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. Right. So that was that was that was Lord's answer to Habakkuk's first complaint. So Habakkuk has come to the Lord and he has said, listen, there's a lot going on right now. There's a lot of evil going on around me. Why haven't you done anything? Can you not hear us? And 
the Lord says that he's raising the Babylonians, Babylonians, and he describes the Babylonians. So for us to see, um, he describes them as ruthless, impetuous people. So they're evil. We see that they're also um, committing um, idolatry. So they are guilty men whose own strength is their God. Um, we see here also they gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. So all in all, God is describing um, people that you wouldn't necessarily expect God to actually be using. These are people who are evil in a sense, people who don't turn to God, people who don't rely on God, people who don't believe in God, um, people who are in a sense worse than uh, the Israelites at this time. Um, and so we see that um, this isn't conventional and it won't be conventional to um, Habakkuk. Um, so yeah, uh, we see that God has answered Habakkuk's complaint. And although it may seem as bad news, there's one positive that we can actually already take from this, and it's that Habakkuk's complaint also impl it implied that God wasn't listening. He, he said, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? But here we can already see that God has been listening all this time because he says that he's raising up the Babylonians. So Habakkuk's cry for um, you know, justice um, is actually already heard has actually already been heard a while back and God has been raising the Babylonians. So that's already one positive we can take from something that seems quite negative. And so, so far, can you also see this dynamic of um, a dialogue between Habakkuk and, and between God? It's, it's, it's almost like a relationship is there. <clears throat> and that's also another <clears throat> key point that I want to um, highlight um, later on. But here we see that God, God is actually speaking with Habakkuk, he's communicating, he's sending him messages. Um, and it's, 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 it's that type of relation that we see throughout the Bible that he's had with many um, other, other prophets and other messengers um, that we should also strive to. Um, but let's just get on to the, the other parts of chapter 1. So, so far we see that there's been a dialogue, um, there's been a complaint, and the Lord has answered Habakkuk's complaint. Now we're on verse 12. O oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. O oh Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O oh Rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while, we, while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I'm actually going to read uh, chapter 2 verse 1 because it ties into um, this structured theme. And he says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to his complaint. So here uh, we see Habakkuk's response to the Lord's response to his initial complaint. And it is a bit to take in, especially the part with the fishes, but we'll get on to that. But what the general gist we can already see is that Habakkuk is complaining again. He has a second complaint. And it's a bit like, it's, it's like, well, Habakkuk, you know, know your place, like, calm down. Um, it's not some random person you're talking to, it's God. Um, but also, I like the fact that he he just expresses himself to God um, as if he was a friend, as if he, he was, it's just a normal relationship. It's a relationship, and I really like that aspect of it. So, yeah, he, at the beginning, we see that he's also, oh, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die, you see? Although he's complaining, although he is upset, he still calls him my God, my Holy One. He he relies on God and he, his complaints come from somewhere innocent. Um, so yeah, you have appointed them to execute judgment. You have ordained them to punish. So he's complaining that these Babylonians are worse than the Israelites. These people are 10 times worse than us. So how are they fit to judge? How are they fit to punish? Um, they're so He says they're evil. Um, 
and you can't tolerate wrong. So how do you tolerate this treacherous people, etc.? So here we see that Habakkuk is really complete. He's complaining again as to why this would happen to them, why his people will be captured by these Babylonians. And we see this analogy uh, that Habakkuk uses to describe the um, Babylonians. Uh, also, you might also hear um, the term Chaldeans, um, but that's just another way of saying Babylonians. Um, so he says, the wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. So at first he says, you have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. Um, the wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his drag net. And so he rejoices and is glad. So let's just look at that and try to break down this analogy. So he, he he's he's comparing himself and the Israelites to um, um, fish in the sea. They have no ruler. They just swim about. Um, this sort of panic mania, which describes Israel at the time um, and the hard hardship that they're going through. And then he says, the wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He drags them in his net and he gathers them up in his drag net. And so he rejoices and is glad. So here we can see that the wicked foe is um, the Babylonians. And the hook, the net, the drag net, these are all different ways uh, to fish. So the hook, you know, a normal fishing hook where that's like one fish. And then a net, which is more fish. And then drag net, which is more fish. Um, so these are all ways that the Babylonians have, you know, grown their kingdom, have overtaken nations. So they have different different methods and different um techniques um, that they use so here we see that Habakkuk has complained himself uh, has come has, has um, displayed himself and people of Israel um, as fish and the Babylonians as fishermen who um, have come to capture them then it says therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? So here we see that the methods that the Babylonians have used to gather these people, to grow their kingdom, to overtake nations, has allowed them to live in luxury and enjoy the choices of foods. So the same way that a fisherman is able to fish, gather fish and eat them, sell them, um, is the same way that the Babylonians um, will use, the Israelites and use the nations that they um overtake to enjoy their lifestyle to enjoy uh, their power their kingdom um, and so he says they sacrificed their nets and burnt incense to their drag nets so the happiness the short-term happiness and the short-term feeling of power um, that these babylonians gain the techniques that they have used to gain these things they worship them and they praise their own gods so here it says Actually, in the Lord's initial answer, he describes the Babylonians as they are. He says that they are guilty men whose own strength is their God. And in here, we also see that they sacrifice to their net and they burn incense to their drag nets. So they, they, they are committing idolatry. That's it. They are basically sourcing their power in the wrong things. They are sourcing their power in their military. They're sourcing power in money. They're sourcing power in idols, wrong gods, you know, gods of wine, etc., etc., and he questions, he says, are, they, are you going to allow them to just keep emptying their net and destroying nations without mercy? So Habakkuk, he's really lowering himself and he's, he's, he's saying, God, how can you allow this to happen? How are you letting evil people prosper? That's basically how are you allowing this to happen? How are you allowing such evil to happen? But what's amazing is, in chapter 2, verse 1, which is why I just read it straight away, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to his complaint. So here he says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on rampart. So this is, again, use of soldier imagery, um, where a soldier will stand on his rampart, um, stand at his post and station himself on the ramparts to see if enemies are coming. Um, that soldier will never move. He has to be there for the good of the kingdom. He has to. He has to stay there. And so the same way that the soldier will stay put, he says that he will stay put and he will stand there waiting for God's response. And that is very, very important. Um, we'll get all, uh, into all of that later. So just so that you can understand what's happened so far, we've had Habakkuk's first complaint. 
we've had the Lord answer. Habakkuk doesn't like his answer and also files a second complaint and says that he will wait for the Lord's answer. And so we get on to chapter 2, the main part of chapter 2, in which we see that the Lord replies to Habakkuk's second complaint. Right. So, let's read it together and then we'll also get into it. So starting from chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith or by his faithfulness. And I'm going to stop it right there. Um, so the same way that we have structured things so far, I'm going to try to do that with chapter 2. And so at the beginning, the Lord is, is telling, you know, Habakkuk, get ready to write what I'm about to tell you. This is a vision. This is a revelation. And it awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, that that is something that I can personally find strength in and something I can rely on because God has a plan. God has that revelation and although it lingers, although we have to wait for it, although we might not even see that the finishing line, it will come to fruition. It will happen. And it won't delay. It won't come earlier. It won't come later than a certain appointed time that God has given it. And so he says, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by faith. And so that is what we can really take from this whole story of Habakkuk. But we'll carry on getting into it. So um, here we just see that the Lord has a revelation that he wants Habakkuk to write down. Um, so carrying on from verse five, it says, Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the people. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you, for you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. So here in this first part, we can see that God is describing this kingdom, this, this sort of Babylonian, the Babylonian people. He says that... Um, they pile up stolen goods, make themselves wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Because you have plundered many nations, the nations who are left will plunder you. So he's describing this cycle of treacherous men and treacherous, you know, because of man's nature, um, this sort of rise and fall of kingdoms. Um, so this it says, because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. So here, God is describing this rise and fall of kingdoms and cities. So the same way that Habakkuk is concerned about the right, like the rise and the growth of the Babylonians, just also to say that well, the Babylonians will fall. And so there's a there's a constant cycle. There's a constant cycle, and he says, "Woe to him who piles up stolen goods." So um, this theme of woes um, is going to continue, and it's. It, We'll get into it, but it basically just describes um, characteristics of these Babylonian kingdoms. So we'll jump on and we'll carry on. So it says from verse 9, Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labour is only fuel for the fire, that nations exhaust themselves for nothing, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours, pouring it from the wineskin until they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. 
and your destruction of animals will terrify you, for you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol, since a man has carved it, or an image that teaches lies, for he who makes it trusts in his own creation? He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. I'm going to stop it right there. So here we see a series of woes, a series of distress described by the Lord. And we see different examples of, of wrongdoing. So, you know, piling up stolen goods. Um, so, you know, things to do with money. Uh, woe to build his realms by unjust gain. So injustice. Um, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. So violence, murder, crime. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbour. Uh, pouring it from wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies, you know, sexual immorality, lust. Um, and then it also says, you know, of what value is an idol, since a man has carved it, so idolatry. So here we see a series of characteristics of, of these types of nations that will rise and fall, um, this this constant cycle. Um, and and he, what's great is that, although he's he's talking to Habakkuk, these characteristics aren't specific to just Babylon. They, they, they are reoccurring to this day. There are nations which practice these things. There are nations, there are people who still practice these things. And so that's where this idea that the story of Habakkuk, although it is so specific to him and in his time, it is so, it's relates to us until now. Um, and there are many ways that it does that. Within these woes, um, we have a series of little replies from the Lord. Well, not little, sorry, a series of replies from the Lord. I had to pat myself there, oh my goodness. Um, and it says, um, for example, um, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has, not, has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labour is only fuel for the fire? Uh, that nations exhaust themselves for nothing, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So here we see that amongst these words and amongst this cycle, the Lord has a reply. The Lord has 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 a reply and the Lord is there. And again, so you will be filled to shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you and disgrace will cover your glory. Again, we see the Lord's presence within this cycle. So the cycle is ever changing and these characteristics are ever changing. However, the Lord is still there to combat these things. And again, it says, of what value is an idol since a man has carved it or an image that teaches lies for he who makes it trust in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. And that's where we stopped. But verse 20 says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In this last sort of part of chapter two, um, there's this reoccurring um, sort of theme of lifelessness. Um, so he says here, woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. He's a living God. He's a living God. So although all of this, all of these things are lifeless, the, the, the idols, the man-made gods, the statues, um, the lack of breath, the gold and silver, all these techniques, the net, the hook, everything that they have praised and they have made their God is lifeless. So the thing that these people draw strength upon, the, the thing that these people rely on, the things that these people rejoice, the things that these people make sacrifices for are lifeless. But the Lord is in, he's presently in his holy temple, not was, not will be, he is in his temple. And let all the earth be silent before him. So amongst all of this havoc, at the end of the day, our Lord is living. He's in his holy temple and the earth will be silent before him. So here we have seen that Habakkuk has complained. The Lord has replied. Habakkuk isn't happy with his reply. And so he complains again and he waits for the Lord's reply. And this time the Lord's reply is beautiful. It's, it's everything that Habakkuk needs to hear and it's something that we need to hear and so we draw onto the last part of the story of um Habakkuk and it's Habakkuk um Habakkuk's prayer 
and chapter three. And so again, uh, we will read this, uh, break it down, and then at the end uh, of all of this, uh, hopefully we can make the right links to us and how we can um, draw from this, especially in um, our, our current situations. Um, and so uh, we'll start. So it says, uh, prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. So in that beginning part, here we see that Habakkuk is, 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 he has heard what God has said. And he pleads him, Lord, please renew your deeds in our day. Um, and in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. So he's asking for the mercy of Lord. Um, as he as he's just learned that the Babylonians will overthrow and will um, invade um, Israel. And then verse 3. God came from Teman, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. So here we see an all-powerful depiction of God, description of God. Um, and I think it, it's so important that that was there because in, in, this, in this chapter we see, um, you know, God having dialogue with Habakkuk, um, God um, speaking with Habakkuk. Um, and in... As someone who could, if you were Habakkuk, it's very easy for for you to just get caught up in, in the source almost. Like, yeah, I'm speaking to God. Like, you know, I'm complaining to God. Uh, and so even after all of this, I think that is so, is so important. To me reading this, to me reading this, that is so important. Because we have a relationship with this all-powerful God, this all-powerful God. That is on our side, uh, this, 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 this God that we fear. Um, and it's so important to be, to, to be reminded by that, to fear God, but to also understand that he's on our team and he's on our side. Um, so, yeah, we have this all-powerful depiction and this description by Habakkuk of God. He's, he still has awe, he still respects, he still loves God. So let's carry on. Verse 8. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow, bow. you called for many arrows. You split the earth with the rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. This all sounds very familiar. I hope you can tell what story this is referring to. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows. At the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head. And when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating us through about to devour. The wretched who were in hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses. Churning the great waters. So here... If you, guess, if you haven't guessed it already, um, Habakkuk is referencing um, Exodus and the story of Moses um, and how he had to save um, the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, which is another example of a Babylonian type kingdom. Oh my goodness. See the way the dots are being connected. Um, see, I didn't even plan that, but it just, it just popped into my head right now. Um, so yeah, um, the, the, Is the Israelites were, were slaves in Egypt. Um, and, and Moses, uh, by the guidance of God, um, went to go uh, save the Israelites. And as they were being chased um, by Pharaoh, here we see um, Habakkuk referencing uh, Moses um, by the power of God splitting the Red uh, Sea. So it says, uh, In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you thrust the Nathans. You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. So here we see God saving his people, delivering his people. So Habakkuk's complaint at the beginning, if you remember, it was that Israel was abandoned, basically. It was divided. It was all going wrong for them. 
Um, and when God said that the Babylonians would come, Habakkuk was scared that the righteous would be persecuted just as the rest of, of, of the evil who were in Israel would by the Babylonians. But here we see this also, this reassuring message, this reassuring story where the Israelites were slaves. However, God had delivered his people. He saved his anointed one. And so we have to hold on to that hope. We have to hold on to that message of, of strength, that message of relying on God. Um, so yeah, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. Uh, with his with his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed up to scatter, to scatter us, gloating us through, um, gloating us though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. So so here we have this reference of Moses um, and this reference of God saving His people. Now we come into verse sixteen, and it says. And from verse 16 onwards is my favourite part of um, this book um, because it's, it's, it's very hopeful and it's something that you could really rely on in these times and it's something that you could really draw strength from. And it says, I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, the cave crept into my bones and my legs trembled. So he's, also, he's referencing when he heard the news that the Babylonians would come into Israel. Yeah, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in, my, in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He knows he knows me to go on to heights. <laughs> I'm gonna read that again. It's so beautiful. I heard my I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. The cave crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yeah, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come when the nations of us. We will be scared. There are things that will scare us. There are there's evil surrounding us. But we have to wait patiently. We have to wait patiently for God to deal with those things. There are things that he's allowed to happen that we may not understand in this moment. We'll get into that in a bit. There are things that he's allowed to happen that we may not understand in this exact moment. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail and the field produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord and I'll be joyful in God my Saviour. So here we see that although times are bleak, although it's all looking downhill for Habakkuk, although it, he has every right to panic, he has every right to just abandon ship, no pun intended, with Jesus and his disciples and waters were rocky and they were scared, if you caught that, you're hard. Um, but basically, yeah, although he has every reason to be scared and every reason to run away, um, he will still rejoice in the Lord and he'll be joyful in God his Saviour. He says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and he enables me to go on to the heights. So despite our current climates, despite everything that's going on, I beg of you to please just make God your strength um, and rely on him. Rely on him heavy because uh, without him, we are nothing. We are fish. Uh, so just a little overview of everything that we've read so far, I know you've heard it a lot and I'm sorry, but it, this is how it helps me to learn and I hope it helps all of you to learn. We have seen that Habakkuk had a complaint and he, he went to God with his complaint. But God gave him an answer. Habakkuk didn't understand the answer. He didn't, he didn't understand. He didn't like, he, he, was, he didn't understand. He didn't understand the answer. And so he goes to God again and he waits at his post to listen to God. God again gives him an answer and then Habakkuk prays. He's hopeful and he relies in the Lord and if that isn't a blueprint, if that isn't a blueprint for us, that is a blueprint for us to follow. It relates to us. Everything that has said to this point relates to us. Just like Habakkuk, we are in evil, we are in an evil environment, we are surrounded by sin, we are the odd ones out. There are, there, are, there are evil people in hem with the righteous. We are integrated. We are surrounded by people who are inherently, who are just, who are sinful. 
and not to not to say that we are any better than these people, but we are surrounded by sin. We are we are in a bad environment, and there are many questions that we may have uh, that we may have for God. Just just how Habakkuk had so many questions and so many complaints. There are so many questions that we may have for God, and bad things may happen to us. So just as how the Israelites were um, under slavery, or just how. Um, the Judeans were in exile and were under threat of Babylonians. Bad things may happen to us. But now it's a question of how do we respond? And we look at Habakkuk to see how he responds. So what does he do? He seeks God. He didn't go to anyone else with these problems. He didn't ask his mom, he didn't ask his dad, although it might, it might have helped. He seek God and no one else but God. He seek God. He seeked his face. He relied on him. He developed that relationship. He listened to his voice. And he didn't ask questions from a place of anger, a place from emotion. It, he asked these questions, but he didn't run away from God. No, he said he's going to wait. He's going to stand at his post and he's going to wait for God to reply to him. So those questions that you may have about our bad environments, about the bad things that are happening to us, don't just, don't just hold them in and then run away from God and get caught up in sin, get caught up in that bad environment. Instead, Express yourself, you know, it's a relationship. It's a relationship that you have with an all-powerful God who's on your side. So why wouldn't you rely on him? Talk to him, you know, express express your questions, ask your questions. But then don't just run off after you've asked your questions. You've got to continue praying. You've got, you've got to stay at your place. You've got don't abandon your place. You've got to stand there. And you've got to wait for God to speak to you. Um, you've got to seek his face. You've got to rely on him. So, yeah, question God, then listen to him. Now, it comes to a point where he might say something that you don't like, or God might say something that you don't want, but it is what you need, and you need to understand that. Um, and there are some passages in the Bible, so for example, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 to 12, it says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. So although God may use evil, treacherous people, as he did with the Babylonians, and bad things may happen to you, or bad things may surround you, God disciplines those he loves. He is patterning you. In the best, like, he is patterning you. You are going left you are going right and god is telling you listen i'm here i'm right here don't abandon me don't don't disobey me. don't leave me don't abandon your post i'm right here again genesis chapter 50 verse 20 sorry not even verse 20 verse 18 his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him we are your slaves they said but joseph said to them don't be afraid am i in the place of god you intend to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So here we say we see that although bad things may happen to you and things happen that you don't understand and that God is allowing Things that don't make sense to you to happen, in the long run, they will they will have they will have their place. If that didn't happen to you, you wouldn't be where you are now. And it's hard to see that from the position that you are in now. But in the future, when you look back on things, it will make sense. And that's what it is. You have to live by faith. You have to live by the faith that God has a plan for you. God has an appointed time that won't delay. It will linger, but wait for it. And so bad things may happen, negative things may surround you, but you have to understand that God has a plan and God has a timing for every single thing. And whilst you linger, whilst you wait, ask God those questions. Develop that relationship with him. Seek his face. Don't abandon his post. He will answer your questions. He will give you peace. He will give you calmness. He will give you happiness. And he, he, will, he will bring you into the plan. He will, he will enact that plan in your life that will be done in your life. And so 
that's what I take from Habakkuk. And these times where I don't understand what's going on, I don't understand why things are happening, I pray. And I rely on God. I rely on God. And I ask him those questions. And I ask him to reveal his plan to me. I ask him for his plan to be done in my life. And so I ask that all of you take a page out of Habakkuk's book and really just any questions that you may have. If you haven't spoken to God in a long time, it doesn't matter. Just get on your knees and speak to him now. And just use the time that we have to really develop that relationship with God. To really develop that wanting to get to know him. That that comfortability to ask him questions. Um, because we all need him. Especially in these times, we all really, really need him. Um, and so, yeah. Um, just a message of hope. A message of renewed strength in Christ, um, rely on him. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just going to pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for allowing us to get to know you more, allowing us to read your word, Lord, allowing us to rely on you, Lord. Please, as you have done with Habakkuk, Lord, hear our questions, hear our, our cries, Lord. Our cries for help, Lord, I ask that you give us comfort, that you give us strength, Lord, despite everything that's going on around us, Lord, I ask that our strength is sourced in you, and that we are comfortable to come to you in any situation, Lord. You are our best friend, you are our father, Lord, and I ask that we remember that, and that we we always have that in mind throughout everything that we do, Lord. Please help those who are less fortunate than us, Lord. Help us to be grateful, to remain humble, and to remain grateful for everything that we have. Despite things going wrong, there is so much that we have, Lord. And I ask that you help us to remain grateful for everything that we do have. Lord, help us to enact what we have learned today and to really implement it into our lives, Lord. And to come back to the word and to come back to you and to rely on you, Lord. I thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.